Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z and Corey Club, the podcast you're looking for. This is, <laughs> yes. For an entire generation, people have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. The force is strong here, even stronger than the coffee. Welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. Here are your hosts, Dan Z and Corey Club. Hello, this is Corey Club, and welcome to show number 34 of Coffee with Kenobi, a Star Wars podcast that analyzes our favorite saga in a whole new way. With me is my good friend and co host, Dan Z. Hello, everybody. The weeks leading up to Celebration have everyone excited and eager to see what Star Wars announcements are coming our way. With the end of Season 1 of Rebels, convention season in full swing, and major announcements coming out all the time, stay tuned to Coffee with Kenobi for the latest announcements and developments from Lucasfilm. Don't forget to join us at Celebration Anaheim for our appearance on the podcasting stage in Room 208 AB from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on April 16th, as we bring Coffee with Kenobi in a whole new way. We can't wait to see everyone there. Also, join me as I discuss the first season of Rebels with Scott Murray, Amy Radcliffe, and Pete Morrison on the Assembly of Geeks special show, Drinks and Geeks. Be on the lookout for a few special shows coming your way from Coffee with Kenobi. We had an exclusive conversation with James Arnold Taylor on Celebration Anaheim and have a show live from Indiana Comic Con with some very special guests. We also have another fantastic conversation with returning guest, Freddie Prince Jr., to take a look at the first season of Rebels. In today's show, Richard and Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland join us to discuss our topic for show number 34, Fostering Community in Star Wars. This wonderful couple brings enthusiasm and a strong sense of community that is contagious as we look at how to keep growing our Star Wars family. We also discuss the news of the standalone film title, the release date of Episode 8, discuss the new Tops Trading Cards app, we also have our next offering of your special shot with the Bearded Shield featuring Rob Wainfer. And now, let's see what's brewing in the Star Wars universe this week. Oh, wait, this is interesting. You found something. I'm about to let everyone in on the secret. For our first news story, we get some news on the, the standalone film that was revealed to be uh, directed by Gareth Edwards. You've got the title out of this. Uh, very exciting. It's starring Felicity Jones. Uh, and the title is Rogue One. Dan, first thoughts? Rogue One. Well, I mean, we talked about this with Joa and Amy at Indiana Comic Con. Mm-hmm. But when I hear Rogue One, I mean, how do you not think of an X-Wing, right? Or an yeah. X-Wing pilot yeah. or something like that. What about you? I mean, it's it's... It's interesting to me because, I mean, here's what we know. Written by Chris Weitz, and the idea came, came from John Knowles, of course, no stranger to Star Wars fans. And it starts shooting in London this summer, and it's going to come out December 16th, 2016. So that's pretty cool. We know yeah. basically almost a year, not quite a year to the day, but just a few days before, we're going to have two Star Wars films in a year. That's that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you think about the title? Yeah, the title itself is interesting because, um, you know, of course, like you said, Rogue One, you instantly think of X-Wing and, and the fleet there. Uh, but, you know, it's it's funny because it's got a, another number in the title. Um, you know, we always equate Star Wars films with you know, Episode 1 or Episode 2 and likewise. Uh, this is Rogue One. So is this uh, initiating a, a title sequence of possible exploratory films, you know, sequels and whatnot, Rogue 2, Rogue 3, likewise? Uh, I, I don't think so, but I think it's interesting the yeah. fact that um, maybe it's a it's a, an introduction to uh, someone who uh, would be um, you know the the burgeoning pilot of uh, the Rebel Force, um, you know, and there's said burgeoning just for Craig's back. <laughs> I did well, you of course, uh, yes, you know it's interesting too because um, it doesn't say Rebel One, which would be maybe I don't know a little more predictable. But, uh, you know, it's a rogue one, so it could be something completely different, too. It could mean a smuggler. It could mean, uh, you know, it could be anybody. It's so it's so obscure in a sense. But, you know, of course, all Star Wars fans jump to uh, an X-Wing, uh, you know, relationship. Oh, I never thought about that. You, you just sort of opened my eyes to other possibilities for who the rogue might be or who the rogues 
might be. I mean, sure. there's there's certainly an enough precedence there to see that. Um, as far as like the actual title itself, I was a little underwhelmed. I mean, I wasn't mm. disappointed. I certainly was not disappointed. I'm going to get more Star Wars films at a quicker pace than we ever have in our lifetime. But I don't know. Uh, we had talked about this again on our Indiana show, but I like the title for The Force Awakens. It pops. It's epic. It's mythological in nature and tone in its scope. Rogue One just sounds... Fast-paced. Eh. I hope so. I mean, you know, I'll be certainly seeing it the first day along with, with everyone else. But, mm-hmm. and again, I'm not disappointed at all in any way, shape, or form. But I thought, oh, okay. I just think I wanted something a little more mythological in scope. But that being said, Rogue One, dude. Star Wars movie. Very cool. And, and I will mention too, you know, I, I relate the title to you. It's a big it's a big draw for folks and fans and you know, of course, The Force Awakens relates to the saga as a whole. You know, it's bringing that the binding together. You have Empire Strikes Back. It's always a something's going on. You know, Rogue One is a is a to me it's a person. Uh, it was a reversal, I think a little bit of what Marvel's doing. It's not an Avengers film. It's not, you know, it's not something like that. It's not a group film. It's maybe it's centered on a uh, center, center person. So maybe this this one person is the Rogue One. So it centers on them. I would assume Felicity Jones' character, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, so maybe that's that's her 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 call sign or of some sort. So uh, you know, we're focusing, I think, on a singular character uh, to branch out into I mean, a new era too. It's not necessarily. It's not you know if it was you know Star Wars, um, uh, the galaxy comes alive or something like that. It would just. That I'm glad would, it's not that. <laughs> that was off the top of my head, but uh, I'm glad too. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's it's interesting because it doesn't relate to a host of you know a universe. It's specific onto one character or a set of characters. Uh, I think that's exciting because it sets it apart just enough to be like, okay, this is a little bit different than uh, the natural flow of the saga. So this is definitely a branch off. I think it's I think it's a good solid title uh, because it tells a lot. But I also think that uh, it's also mysterious enough to be like, oh, what's really going on here? So I think it's done really well. Well, let's extrapolate that, too. I mean, you're again, you're opening my eyes to things. If it's <laughs> Rogue One, like this is the first spinoff film. It's sort of a rogue of the Star Wars universe because sure. it's its own little thing. And again, we don't we know next to nothing, pretty much nothing about it. But that's interesting, Corey. I, I'm interested to see what happens and... We'll keep on going along for this amazing ride of Star Wars 2015 and beyond. But that's not all the amazing news that came out of this press release, Corey, as you know. In fact, I read the first part about Rogue One so quickly. I sort of missed, <laughs> I saw the A New Hope in 1977. I sort of glazed over everything else. But we've got a date for Episode 8. And it's mm-hmm. also officially confirmed that Ryan Johnson is writing and directing Episode 8, which is really, really cool. And it's May 26th, 2015. Wow! Yeah, that's. I mean, I think this is crazy. Uh, yeah, because, tell me why? Well, I mean, we knew uh, we would get Star Wars films one after another like this, but I guess I didn't fully realize, you know, within like a five month span, six months. Yeah. Well, a five month span. Yeah, May. May uh, let's see, December to May is you know five or six months relatively, but you know, it, it's it's striking to me because. Um, you know, we get some of the saga storyline, then we get a standalone film. Does that connect to the saga in a whole? I would assume it does in some respects. But then again, you know, why not just camp out in front of the theater for another six months? Who cares, right? Well, you know, you may want to take a shower or something. Like <laughs> or get some I mean, food, if, yeah. If get I'm hungry, sitting yeah. in line next to you, I hope that you do at some point. <laughs> I'm excited about this because we're back to May. We're back to Star Wars. Yes, May. yeah, this is classic. Christmases of Star Wars, which... I gotta be honest, if anyone listened to our show where we first found out that episode 7 was gonna be released Christmas 2015, you heard how excited we were about the whole <laughs> Christmas prospect. In fact, I still, all last Christmas, I was thinking about, ooh, next Christmas I'm gonna have a Star Wars movie. So I do love that, but there's something uh, rather poetic about switching it back to a May schedule. And again, unprecedented stuff going on. You had to wait every three years for Star Wars films for the first six, which I really liked because I like. Of course, between episodes, mm-hmm. you know, some brief Return time. of the Jedi sure. in episode one, it was much longer than that. But I like the anticipation, but just knowing that we're going to have them in, in rather rapid succession, you know, considering what we're used to, this is pretty remarkable. So you don't have long to wait, and it just hypes up everything. Talk about faster, more intense. This is what yeah, the right. Star Wars shooting schedule is, and 
again, taking another page out of the whole Marvel blueprint and it's worked beautifully for them. And I see no reason to think that that will not continue here. Next up, we have our expressor shot with the bearded chair with Rob Wayne we apologize on my mistake, uh, some editing uh, mishaps. Um, I happened to edit in the wrong expressor shot from Rob. Uh, our apologies for any folks that got confused and mixed up. Um, that just happens. Uh, it has, I'm surprised it hasn't happened before. So uh, our apologies to fans and listeners, uh, maybe taking it back, some of the older news that uh, Rob has so keenly uh, reported on for us. Uh, we'll definitely update that. And here's a new one just for you. And now, your espresso shop with the Bearded Trio. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another espresso shot with the Bearded Trio, bringing you all the latest news on Spielberg, George Lucas, and John Williams. So let's get straight into the news. Okay, let's address those Indiana Jones rumors that have been going around the internet recently. Deadline have reported that Steven Spielberg is interested in directing Chris Pratt in Indy 5, uh, which Deadline also reported a few weeks ago that Chris Pratt was rumored to be on board. Uh, Now, the article reports that the information has come from their source and that Spielberg would be interested in returning to the Indiana Jones franchise if the script was up to a good standard. Now, I was intrigued by this, so decided to do a little digging myself, and I contacted an official source for Steven Spielberg from DreamWorks, and at this moment in time, there is no news on the director being attached to any Indiana Jones project. Uh, That's not to say he won't be involved, but at this time... Uh, my source told me that he is focused on his latest projects, St. James Place and BFG, based on the Raoul Dahl children's books. Now, Deadline do explain that it's early days and there is currently no script. Um, I totally agree with the article that it's a great idea that Spielberg was involved in Indy 5, but uh, at this moment in time, I would just be happy with just an official announcement that Indiana Jones 5 is actually happening. <coughs> Now, I just want to make you aware of a magazine that you can download off the internet called Indie Mag. It's completely free. It's an Indiana Jones magazine from fans, and it has some amazing articles in there. It's The quality is just outstanding. Uh, It's just like buying one of those glossy, expensive magazines. Uh, It's called the Indie Mag. It's completely free. I'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, if you're an Indiana Jones fan, you have to read this. You will not be disappointed. <coughs> Who do you think is the most thanked person at the Oscars? Well, Vocative website decided to examine 1,396 acceptance speeches. Somebody had to do it. In order to see who had been thanked the most over the years. And guess who came in at number one? Yes, Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg has been thanked 42 times during the history of the Oscars, uh, compared to second place person Harvey Weinstein with 34. James Cameron was third with 28. George Lucas, another bearded trio, came in fourth, 23. Peter Jackson, 22, came in fifth. God came in at number six with 19. Uh, other notable mentions, Francis Ford Coppola came in ninth with 16 thanks, and Ma- Martin Scorsese came in 10th with just 15. There we go, Steven Spielberg, the most thanked person at the Oscars. <coughs> Lin Wen Brennan is the new general manager for Lucasfilm, having been president and general manager of Industrial Light and Magic. She's enjoyed a 16-year career at ILM in her new role, Her new challenge will be to see all operational matters for Lucasfilm, ILM and Skywalker Sound. She will report to Kathleen Kennedy and Alan Bergman of Walt Disney Studios. Now, she said, I'm going to be concentrating on the operations of Lucasfilm and to make sure we have a company where everybody can bring their best game and also collaborating and communicating with our partners at Disney and our partners throughout the Lucasfilm organization make sure that we are nurturing the Star Wars franchise in the right way and that we have a long-term strategic vision for the company. And I'm sure you'll join me in wishing Ling Wen all the best of luck in 
her new role at Lucasfilm. Now, reaction figures will be releasing a set of action figures from the legendary Steven Spielberg and my number one film, Jaws. Uh, now, reaction figures in the past have done some fabulous figures. They've done the likes of Goonies, uh, Back to the Future, Alien. Um, and these figures are awesome. They have a very distinct retro feel. They, they have a, like an 80s packaging, uh, like classic Kenner figures. And they will be bringing out uh, some Jaws figures. Uh, they're they're available to pre-order. They'll be available in July. And you will be able to get your hands on Matt Hooper, Martin Brody, Quint, and of course, Bruce himself, the big white shark. Uh, so make sure you get your orders in so then you can recreate your favorite scenes from my favorite movie, Jaws. Well, there we go. That's all the news. Just one extra bit of news. Uh, Star Wars Rebels, Vanessa Marshall... And Clone Wars' James Arnold Taylor are set for an animated series based on Guardians of the Galaxy. It will be hitting TV screens sometime this year. It will be on Disney XD. Uh, so make sure you check that one out because with the likes of uh, the voice talents of Vanessa, Marsh- Vanessa Marshall and James Arnold Taylor on board, um, I'm sure it's going to be one to watch. So there we go. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to email me rob at thebeardedtrio.com um, I'll hand you back to Dan and Corey thanks again goodbye Han Solo Rebel Soldier Lando Calrissian and Bespin Guard each sold separately from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back Collection new from Kenner looking found someone you have I would say hmm? your lightsabers will make a fine addition to my collection all right. The, again, the news just keeps on coming along. We just got news previously about Journey to Star Wars, The Force Awakens, all the books that are coming out um, from comics and young adult novels and things like that. And we we sort of it sort of was hinted to that there was novels. Now we have something concrete about it. It's the first novel in a series, which is going to be a trilogy, Star Wars Aftermath. You should see the cover. It's by Chuck Wendig. Pretty phenomenal. Here's a brief synopsis for it. The second Death Star has been destroyed. Rumors are flying that the Emperor and his enforcer, Darth Vader, are dead. A new government is forming to replace the Empire. But the galaxy is a big place, and the fallout of this cataclysm will affect different worlds in different ways. Does everyone accept the fall of Imperial rule? Has everyone even heard the life-altering news? What rushes in to fill the vacuum the Empire has left? And who will try to stop them? Corey, boom, your thoughts. Yeah, you know, you and I kind of talked about this over some texts and some some, some time uh, just hanging out. And, you know, I, I, I feel like this is kind of a, a quick grab a little bit. It's kind of like a, um, it's a lot of plugging information in just to kind of catch up uh, to when the, you know, the new movie comes out. I feel like they're kind of trying to fill in gaps as far as, um, you know, what's going on thus far uh, with our heroes and what's going on in the galaxy. Um now, that's not to say I could be completely and utterly wrong, and I hope that I really am. I really do wish the best for this. Uh, to me, it feels like it's, uh, it's a little little quick to, to move. But, you know, the story group has really surprised me in the past uh, with a lot of things that have come out. Uh, they seem to be on their toes on everything, uh, have a good plan. I feel like everything is everybody's moving in the correct cogs in the, in the whole machine of itself. Uh, the comics seem to be working nicely. The, the new novels are coming out. All the um, you know, uh, rebel stuff seems to be moving quickly and, and really well done. So another positive note too is you know it's written by Chuck Windig, who's got a catalog of all kinds of urban uh, fantasy stuff under his belt. Uh, you know, all kinds of like horror stuff, mysteries, uh, thrillers, things like that. It's kind of the weird side of things, but um, to, you know obviously he's got a, a huge uh, weight of, of writing on his side, and he constantly does some, some great work. So, Dan, what are your thoughts as well? I mean, I know you talk in the positive because you're very excited about this. Well, look at the cover. See how the Death Star is exploding? Mm-hmm. That's my head. I'm very <laughs> excited about it. <laughs> I'm always excited about it. I mean, I mean, we were actually just talking about this in, in the car with, with Tom when we went yeah. to Indiana Comic Con. And Marvel had said that there's going to be some comics that are going to tell us what happened at Return of the Jedi. And I thought that was a little bittersweet because I love the comic book medium. I feel like something we've been waiting 30 years to find out what happened right after Return of the Jedi when the Empire's in complete disarray and destroyed from the core out. 
I feel like it deserved more than just some comics. And again, it's not to slander the comics. It's more like, wow, we need more. And I remember even saying we need a book. And then I see this and I found out it's part of a trilogy. I don't know if all three books um, all take place before The Force Awakens or what. But I think this is phenomenal. So phenomenal. And of course, I am a little bit biased because... You know, I'm going to hopefully get a chance to see this book a little bit before it comes out in September. I, I really can't wait. I've been wanting to see what happens after Return of the Jedi for a long time. Now, I know there's a lot of risk involved. I, I certainly mm-hmm. had mixed feelings about the latest Luke Skywalker book, Heir to the Jedi. So I'm hoping it'll be a little bit stronger than that. And I'm sure that it will. It just, I mean, the cover alone looks really really promising star wars aftermath i mean i this is a dream come true to me honestly you know in regards to the cover it, it is really great looking it's nice and big um there's no people on the cover which is surprising for a star wars bu- book you know usually we have a character on the front uh, with this we have the death star uh, blowing up and there's a little x-wing um i think what what causes me some frustration uh is the title aftermath sounds like oh, sim- is it like how i felt about rogue one yeah a little bit so it seems like it's uh, let's just let's just wrap things up and let's just you know tell the folks some 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 side stories and some fun things have gone along the way and I think also the uh, the other title um, the journey to the Star Wars uh, the Force Awakens it just seems a little bit forced no pun, pun? no pun intended no pun intended. <laughs> uh, you well know, I mean we well, we know we knew we talked about the Star last show we knew that mm-hmm. that was sort of the thing what other title would you suggest I don't think I would do a journey to the Star Wars the Force Awakens it sounds, seems too commercial to me. I would keep well, it more. I would keep you more know you're talking about saga. a four billion dollar company, right? True, but I mean, it, it, it just seems like um, you know, we need a gradual uh, walk into this, and then maybe this is it. I, maybe I, that like should be it. A, uh, a gradual walk to the Force Awakens. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, don't run. Ju- just walk gradually. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's it's exciting because uh, you know we talked about earlier all a bunch of you know things are coming out this this fall. And we're gonna be. I mean, the merchandising is gonna be huge for this film, obviously. Uh, and they don't want folks just jumping into seats and just you know seeing a, a new film, which I'm okay with. That's okay with me. But the you know fans want to know what went on between that 30 year gap. And uh, sure, you know, this is it. This is gonna be it. Um, this but how again, do you? I, I I value and I respect sure your opinion I, I, tremendously. Obviously, so tell me what how you think this should have been handled differently. If you if you're sort of like. Mm, because, I mean, you mentioned the story group. They've surprised you. Um, they haven't done anything but be consistent mm-hmm. and and keep things uh, tightly connected. So, that for that reason... What do I, I, what would I do? Yeah. I would do... I would go back to our first news story. I would title something called Rogue One. And that's our trip back to 30 years. But not necessarily centering on... So you our, want the our main characters. Like well, it, it, it's it's similar to what uh, I, I Marvel does. Yeah. It's not necessarily. It's not a flashback movie. It's not. We're not. Here's the young Luke. Here's young Han and Han, young Leia doing their thing, and you know, you know, trying to recast that. Here's a story from a different perspective. You know, I, I think it'd be, it would still give the history of the thirty year gap. I still think that it would introduce us to brand new characters we can get excited about, and still have that background of the rebel forces rising into you know the empire still trying to grasp hold of control so i think there'll be a nice callback to that in a film format okay now that makes more sense to me it's not that the book is fine but you think this deserves sure yeah. uh, well hey you're i not think gonna get an argument from me on that <laughs> now it makes sense why you do yeah and it wasn't necessarily in my thought process until they did announce rogue one so you look at the announcements and how these are coming out like this so they announced the movie first, right? And they announced the book. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, they would do something like that. Why, you know, obviously this stuff's going to come fast and kind of come hard, but that's what Disney does. I mean, di- I mean, I think that's all the story group does. They need to get on the pony here and start knock on stuff out, you know. So they, and I think they are. You I think they, no, I'm, I agree with them. that. I think they're doing, yeah. I think they're doing, like you said, they're doing a great job. I have not I have any problem with anything that's come out yet, so... I mean, other than the Luke book, really was I felt really was disconnected. I think they should have dropped that. I mean, hate to say that that way, but mm-hmm. I think they should have published that Luke book into um, the Legends line. But I think that would have been the press would have been eating that up, eating that alive. But interesting, interesting. I, I think that's pretty valid. I also think that um, the Rogue One thing they have to keep building and not distracting from Episode Seven, but right. keeping 
your appetite whetted well, for that for that sort of basic, thing. So you can't. Yeah. You, you're gonna have to put out a book before. I mean, let, I think when we go in to see The Force Awakens, we've seen the first six films. We're ready, right? We're sure, ready, sure. and the casual fan is ready. Um, but for the diehards and the uh, the bibliophiles who love Star Wars books, right. this is going to add some stuff for them that they can take and look for Easter eggs in the films and how they tie back to the book. Mm-hmm. So it, this is another example of, of savvy marketing and savvy storytelling. Well, my other issue, too, is, you know, what's going to be in this book that won't reveal anything in, in The Force Awakens? You know, I'm going to be, I've always been looking for Easter eggs. I've been looking for these little secrets. Uh, and I, I, I want to save that that for the film. I don't want to be like, oh, this is, you know, this is Dan Zare. This is the new character. And all of a sudden, Dan Zare pops up in the film. Like, oh, they're just doing that just to, you know. You know that would be quite a spoiler. <laughs> Like I wouldn't even—I didn't even think it happened. You didn't know you're in the film, well, did you? Yeah. Well, there you go. Okay, so boom, uh, collector news going wild. Tops announces their Star Wars trading card app. We got a press release about it, and we've been talking to uh, our friends from Tops about it. And Corey, I know you're dying to talk about this. <laughs> Tell me your initial thoughts before I—I I jump in with my exploding head. Yes, uh, you know it's fascinating because I just downloaded the app uh, this afternoon just to check it out. We got talking about it um, in the car in Indiana and kind of some thoughts and, the, and things. And I, my first take of it when it first was you know announced, I was like, oh, it's a digital trading cards. I, I, I that's kind of cool. It's revolutionary as far as you know digital age and nowadays and and whatnot. And I was like, well, you know what what what's the what's the advantage here? What's what does this you know, have to do with you know, is this going to introduce us to some new characters, or is this going to be something that's you know going to kind of like, we'd say, like I say, you know, give us some more information about the new film? And it it was a little underwhelming for me. I got on and, and created a name and started opening packages. Um, there's just pictures like you know, they're just looks like the old trading card set, which I never grew up with. So I can't, I don't have, ah. I guess I don't have the passion. I think that's what's missing of this equation for me. Uh, is the you know I never grew up with the original uh, trading card series. Uh, you know it's it's interesting because a lot of folks did and they just they be, they're very into that. And you, my friend, are very into that. So tell us your thoughts. I think you say you, my friend, are very old. I think <laughs> that that's that Cause, too. Because I'm actually not. Um, yeah, this is wonderful. Uh, there's the main reason. There are a few reasons why it's great. For one thing. These cards, I, I grew up with these cards. I love them. You know, they're scattered all over the place now, but they're just fantastic. And now you have them digitally, so you don't have to worry about losing them and keeping track of them. And it's free. Mm-hmm. It's free yeah. to download. You get free credits every day uh, for doing certain little things. So you can use these credits, basically like pretend money, if you will, to buy new packs. And it's, it's, a, it's a random thing. But now you've got this digital community of Star Wars fans we're exchanging the cards with one another. The red ones are really, are really, really rare. The blue ones are rare. Uh, the rest of them are pretty commonplace. And then you can get the the Force Awakens cards uh, from what we saw in Entertainment Weekly when they first announced the names of all these characters. And at the time of this recording, I have all of them except for Poe Dameron, which is pretty cool. Uh, and if anybody wants to trade with me, it's Dan Z C W K, all one word. So that should be easy. And Corey, what's yours? Mine is Corey C W K. Um, there you go. See, I, I got yeah. a bunch of the cards already because I've been playing with this um, ever since we found out the news. Mm-hmm. And it's fun. I know I can see where it can be intimidating, but you've got all the cards digitally in here. You've got the Force Awakens cards, and you can get on the app and you can trade with other people. And we're going to have someone from Tops on very, very soon in the future to sort of give us uh, even more breakdown of how this thing works. But it's a ton of fun if if you want to send us tweet us your your card ID for tops and we'll add you as friends and we'll do some trading. Hey, hey everyone. This is Richard. And this is Sarah. And we are from skywalking through Neverland. And you're listening to coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z and Corey club. This is the podcast you're looking for. Luke, you're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. I must be allowed to speak. You've taken your first step into a larger world. Our topic for show number 34 is fostering community in Star Wars. Why is it important to you to foster community? 
What are some examples you have seen in fandom that foster community? And how can we continue to work to build up our fandom in a positive, productive way? Joining us on this topic are Richard and Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland. Richard and Sarah set the podcasting world ablaze when Skywalking Through Neverland appeared in September of 2013 with their passion, enthusiasm, and fan engagement. They focus on all the latest in Star Wars and Disney and are incredibly active in the fan community. They are the perfect guests for this topic as they do such a wonderful job of fostering our Star Wars community. We are excited to have a cup of coffee with them. Welcome, Richard and Sarah. Well, it's going to be very hard to follow that up. Yeah, wow. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, guys. You're welcome. It's always easy to tell the truth, and, and we were very fortunate to to be on, <laughs> on your show, and we had such an incredible time with that. It, it was probably one of my favorite interviews that I've been a part of, quite honestly. Oh, oh ours too, because we, we all talk podcast. Exactly. Mm-hmm. All, all different language. That's right. That's right. Same same passions and uh, just different avenues, but there's so much there, and, and there's a lot that I want to ask you, and, and I'll, I'll start with... But this one, how did the two of you meet, and when did the two of you realize you had so much in common? We had met at a uh, a swing dance party, a Halloween, a swing Halloween dance swing party. dance. We're all in costume, nice. so need- needless to say, I was Anakin Skywalker, <laughs> <laughs> and I come walking in, and I notice across the room. This little, what would you call your outfit? Your, like I was a barmaid wench. Yeah, okay. Oh, all right. Wow. <laughs> Anakin. Now, just, just for the, just as a side note, I knew what she was, but I didn't want to call her a wench. That's, that's what it was. That was I know, okay. Outfit. All right. And she was looking very wenchy. So, <laughs> of course, we were, we were drawn to each other, but she, she came well, over to me. Yes. And she said, Can I dance with a Jedi? And immediately I was like, okay, let's get married. <laughs> <laughs> Proposed right there. Good. It's, uh, I did. Got, got, got down on one knee and gave her my glove. <laughs> <laughs> and so just, I was very, very surprised that she, and I shouldn't have been surprised because it was 2005 when Revenge of the Sith was big, but, but she knew who, what a Jedi was. And that just excited me. So we, we danced all night long and Kind of lost touch after that until January when I went back to that same club hoping she was going to be there. And lo and behold, she was. Yeah, that was my swing dance club. Every Wednesday night, I'd go swing dancing. So when I saw new fresh meat in the room, <laughs> I, I was like, oh, I better Bounced. go ask him to dance because otherwise, I don't, I, you know, everyone always asked me to dance and I never got a chance to dance with the newbies. <laughs> so, yeah, we were, we were talking and she, was bringing up Star Wars because she had known that I was Anakin that last time. So she brought Star Wars up and I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is interesting. Mm-hmm. And looking out in Hollywood, I was mainly dating actresses, which I vowed never to do again. <laughs> so I had two rules for dating, no actresses, no one in their twenties. Well, I broke one of those rules that week yep. <laughs> <laughs> because Sarah was in her twenties. So, but she was a very mature girl in her twenties. Mm-hmm. So it really worked out, and me being 12 years older, we were kind of on the same level. Yeah. <laughs> I, totally, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, and it really took off from there because on our, on our first date, you know, I don't know about you, but I always make it like a, like a topic list of questions to ask. <laughs> so when, when that time like comes podcast, and we're yes. <laughs> like looking at each other, what's that? So like a podcast. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, really, the, the podcasting began that night. <laughs> so, Richard, you were making your list of topics, and I was making sure my lipstick was right and what outfit to wear. <laughs> yeah, so and we, all, we all had our priorities. Yes. <laughs> and that my car was clean. Always a plus. Yeah, and I told her I'd be picking her up at 7.34 p.m., which mm-hmm. I made sure to get there at 7.34 because I'm usually about four minutes behind, and I was right on time <laughs> that night. Very good. <laughs> And yeah, so I had my, my list of questions, but before really I got to any of those, we started talking about John Williams and threw the list out from there. Yeah, it was like the topic was made, a connection was made, and we stayed out till 2 a.m. on a work night. Wow, wow. What a, what a story. You guys are, are that, that's so sweet, uh, a sweet way to, to have met each other and, and to reminisce. Uh, it, you know, it's it's... So neat that you guys have uh, found fandom right off the or off the bat like that. I think that's that's really cool. Uh, yeah, that was really really important for me. If I was going to go out with a with a girl, she would have to appreciate Star Wars because mm-hmm. I had dated a couple of girls who one had said, "Now who's Darth Vader?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
All right, you're out. Yes. <laughs> one girl said, oh, you're one of those? All right, you're out. <laughs> yeah, I think in, in that context, you know, um, we recently had our wives on, and they they kind of butchered the the <laughs> – the uh, trivia section, but you know, I had their own unique answers. So Dana, I can attest to that uh, as far as uh, <laughs> so them not, not knowing so much, but you know, I think it's not so much of the, them knowing the right answers, but it's also knowing uh, how to, um, you know, ad- uh, enhance that, that other person and, and what they love. But I'm curious to know too, is, uh, you know, as you guys said, you met and, and were instantly brought together of their love of John Williams and, and star Wars and, and and I want to know who who was the bigger Star Wars fan uh, when you met for the first time, and how did you foster and share that passion for Star Wars and Disney with one another? Well, I would say that Richard was kind of the bigger fan, but kind of. Well, <laughs> well, you were, but see, my fandom, I was kind of in hibernation. Um, <laughs> like I had been a huge Star Wars fan in my teens. Uh, in the dark times, and then from from then when I got into college, a lot of my friends were more into Disney, and so we go to Disney a lot. I tend to be swayed a lot by my friends, <laughs> so um, you know I was into that, and I probably wouldn't have gone to any Star Wars celebrations or anything like that. But Richard brought back, brought me out of that Star Wars hibernation, and so now I would say I'm just as big a fan, but just in a different way. Like you're more of a collector, Richard, and I'm more of a You know, I love the music or, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So I think that, so yeah. We both have our different aspects of it. Yes, our different aspects of the fandom, I think. And um, and you, I had a Disneyland annual pass, and so did you, actually, uh, when we met. I think mine had just lapsed. Oh, okay. So I made you a Disney annual pass holder. Yes, yes. (laughs) And, And actually our first, not our first date, our first Valentine's Day which was my first Valentine's Day ever with a guy, finally, because I had people always um, dump me or I would dump oh. them in January. <laughs> but in a way, that can be good because then you save money. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. You stay through the holidays, dump them in January so you don't have to have that. <laughs> Your wife is a lucky woman. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So we went to Disneyland for Valentine's Day. And um, so we both kind of helped each other. Like, I think you said, Richard, that you always enjoyed watching me enjoy Disneyland. Yes. Yeah. That's, that was that's a lot awesome. of fun. And, and so that's really what what I what made me get the Disneyland pass, because she was so excited to go back to Disney. And I was on the fence. But I thought, yeah, you know what? To, seeing her, to see her so excited about this made me want to get it. And then sharing those moments with each other at Disneyland. And I'm so glad I, I did it. I'm so glad you, talk, you talked me into it. Yeah, and I'm so glad that, you know, you brought me out of my Star Wars hibernation so we can experience all this fun stuff, podcasting and going to Star Wars Celebration together and everything. Yeah, but needless to say, you were a Star Wars fan even way before I met you. Yes. When we had gone back to Texas, where, where Sarah's from, she had this box of Star Wars toys. <laughs> and guess who has those now? <laughs> ah, very oh, good. Yes. <laughs> well, that's yes. pretty cool. So it's almost like a, a role reversal where, uh, Richard, you played the role of Bush and you broke into the, the swingers <laughs> dance at her Chavez <laughs> Palace and you got Sarah out of the carbon freeze of her fandom. Yeah, I like that. Oh, yeah. that's cute. Yeah, I could see that. Very good way of putting that. So there's a, there's a cosplay idea for celebration. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we may need to explain that to some people, but it's a good that's idea. True. So, so skywalking through Neverland, I mentioned at the top of the show, is just it's just a delightful, wonderful show to listen to. Even just talking to you now, like while I'm talking to you, I'm smiling. I probably look like the Joker, but it's just you guys just bring out this wonderful thing in your listeners, which we always have admired. So, tell us how does skywalking through Neverland come about? Well, before I begin that, I just want to say that if you bang a guy's head through a pencil, it's not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> His Just first trip, yes. Not that Joker, the the friendly one. The friendly, the, the Mark Hamill Joker, yes. The one from, you know, 30 years ago. Oh, this, he's a Romero Joker. Okay, all right. Romero. Just wanted, wanted to paint a picture there. Yes, the mustache you. and everything, yes. <laughs> Come on, Sarah. <laughs> uh, she, she's a youngin'. She's a youngin'. Okay, Skywalking Through Neverland. We, we started this podcast right after we had done our fan film called TPZ, which basically is TMZ in the Star Wars universe. Which is great fun. Oh, thank you much. And we had spent about four years on this. And then when it was over, 
dust had settled. I really wanted to get back because I get a, a film production background. I went to Emerson Film College. I worked in the film business for about 10 years. And so I, I had this production bug in me. And listening to all these other podcasts, I, I, I always thought there's no way we could ever do something like that. And then little by little, I was, I was thinking maybe we can do this because we're doing so much in the fan community and posting it on Facebook and, and getting a lot of comments by people saying, that sounds like a lot of fun. Tell me more. Tell me more. And then it, that just fed into, let's dive into this scary world of podcasting and yeah. we'll see what happens because on a weekly basis, we're just doing so much fun stuff because Disneyland is 20 minutes away, yeah, our- living in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Knowing that 2015, so many events are happening here. Yeah. Uh, so we said, all right, let's let's hold hands and jump right in and just start podcasting. And since then, it's been so much fun. And our main goal since the, from the beginning was to focus on the fans. Because we had noticed that the fan community was its own, its own oxygen. Mm-hmm. And we really mm-hmm. wanted to play off of that because there was just so much going on. We were going to kamikazes and comic cons and celebrations and and the fan community really had a life of its own and it was just so many so many fun people within that community that to talk to, to yeah that we wanted to get to know too. yeah and you guys are spending so much time on your fan film or your cosplaying outfit on whatever you're doing but it really needs to be seen or heard by a, a bigger audience so we really wanted to showcase them that's that's excellent. I I love hearing that because that's that's what we like to try to do here on, with Coffee or Kenobi. Give fans a voice to kind of give their opinion on on topics and get their their voice heard. And it's so important, I think, to to the Star Wars community as well. Uh, and you know, why, in your guys' opinions, is it important uh, to foster a community such as this? I mean, you mentioned you know uh, fans you know getting uh, able to to put their spotlight there their passion uh, as far as what they like to do. Uh, but why is it important uh, to, to do something like this for the, uh, the community? Well, I think um, for me, it's kind of been growing. Like for me, I got into Star Wars when it was the dark times in 91 was the first time I ever saw it on video. Mm. And it was a very singular internal experience. You know, I'd come home from school or all that summer. I'd like watch, rewatch and rewatch the movies all by myself. I'd read the EU novels, you know, myself and it, it wasn't until I found some people that also love Star Wars that uh, all of a sudden I got so excited because there was other people like me. And the first time I, I met someone like that, I, I almost couldn't speak because <laughs> I was shaking so much. I was like, oh, my God, you, you like Star Wars? You had this connection, too? Like, I thought it was just me, you know? So I think that um, it, you, you form an unbreakable deep bond with these, with these people, mm-hmm. and I think it's important to foster that bond. I mean, you know, you meet someone who has that love of Star Wars like you and already you're on the same level. And I think it's important that you, you know, like everyone in the fan community is so, so nice and so great. I just think we need to keep on positively like reasserting that. Yeah. Did you have anything to add? Oh, I sure do. In my opinion, Star Wars fans are the greatest And I say that because whenever we're talking to fans, there's always a thread, and that thread is charity work. There's just so much charity work that these people do with the 501st, the Rebel Legion, our friend Sean Crosby is always doing something charitable. Scott Allen, who we just talked to uh, from the 501st, is always focusing on charities. Everyone's always focusing on charities. Our friend Simon Wilkie over in England every week and is doing something with make a wish. And I think that is just so fantastic that these people see that they have a platform and they're going to use it to help other people. And that's such a great, the circle is now complete moment because that's what star Wars is all about helping others in need. That's a great point, Richard. And also I want to just comment too that, uh, you know, it, it gives fans and, and folks in the community a chance to reach out through Star Wars too. That maybe they're unsure in what to do and, and what to kind of how to express their fandom. And this, these folks that are, are doing these these great events, like you said, the charity events and things, they can go out and become part of the five hundred first and and you know be a part of that and and you know put put smiles on people's faces and and, and just enjoy what they do uh, at, for a good cause. So ch- cheers to to them and and everyone that involved. Oh yeah, here here. 
And they're just, just saying just that when they go and visit these kids in these hospitals who are mm-hmm. sometimes terminal, mm-hmm. uh, they bring such a huge smile to their face. And what, what Scott Allen, he does a lot of Darth Vader appearances. He said it's a good thing he's wearing a helmet because sometimes he can tear up. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it just, and especially now, like it just, I don't know. I, I seem, I feel like I'm even more aware of it than I was before just having a little boy of my own. And yeah, you, it's just so important. And what you're talking about is fostering community. Do you have other examples that you've seen in Phantom that help to foster community? Because you're such good advocates for that. Yeah, I do. The Ashley Eckstein's Her Universe Fangirl of the Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's an amazing uh, community thing. And, you know, each morning she tweets out the new fangirl of the day. And I, I always go, look, I try to retweet that. And um, that's actually how Trisha Barr and I met. Oh, really? And, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was through that. I was fangirl of the day. And she, I think, retweeted it. And um, Twitter is just a great way to meet fans, too. Yes. Um, yeah. So now and now we're both on podcasts together. So it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Social media really does help foster this fandom. Yeah. Like we were, for instance, we were on the Star Wars Celebration Anaheim Facebook page and there were a lot of people saying, I don't know how to do this and how do I do that? And if I cosplay this, will I, will people think I'm weird? Should I cosplay as that? Where do I go? What do I do? What should I do first? So that's how we came up with a segment on Skywalking Through Neverland called Skywalking to Celebration, where we have some, some fans come on and tell us how they're prepping for Celebration. So other people can get a great idea of what the convention is all about, what to do to prepare, and just what to expect. And that's been such a huge hit uh, when people have, will write back to us and say, oh, I'm so glad you guys brought this point up. And, oh, I didn't even think about that. Thank you very much for that. And in the coming weeks, we're going to have a couple of more people on who have never been to a celebration. So they're going to get a chance to ask us, okay, what do I do there? What do I do? How do I s- schedule this out? And we can help them because we've been to, what, five celebrations at this point yeah. so we have we've got a good idea of oh wow how to, how to wow. work your way around a, a big convention like this and and that's and people have been really responding very positively because they're getting a lot of answers they didn't know where else to get these answers from right and that's a great way to um get people excited and psyched up and also to help them feel a sense of comfort because mm-hmm. there is that fear of the unknown i this will be my second celebration i went to three Celebration 3 in Indianapolis. And Corey's never been. Yeah, that's my, my first one. So I'm going to have to include in some of those podcasts. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> what to wear? Sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know what you'll wear. A coffee with Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully some, some nice looking pants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just bring a lot of Starbucks gifts cards because you're not getting any sleep. <laughs> there you I go. Know. That concerns yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> but all, all, all in good fun. I mean, I'm, I'm excited just to... We always talk about here on the show we t- to to meet fans we like to have fans on too and and like I said we just it fosters such a great community and what a great way to to you know meet each other at at, at a celebration to be able to shake each other's hands and you know interact face to face with folks and that we've been talking through the internet uh, all this time and and be able to just talk about our fandom in in a, a, a just a fun environment uh, so that kind of brings me to the next question uh, how can we continue to build our fandom uh, into a positive productive productive culture and, and that embraces diversity. I know it's such on the forefront now. It seems to be like a hot button topic as far as uh, films that are being made today and, and conversations they're having on, on the internet. Uh, what would be something that you guys would uh, kind of express or from your side of the mic uh, to be able to uh, put that into Star Wars community? Just like we, what we learned in the movies, help each other. Mm. And when we first started out doing Skywalking Through Neverland, we reached out to a lot of podcasters who took out their time and helped us to build our first show. That was very, very important. And I was was so happy to know that so many people in this podcasting community are all there to help each other and not trying to hold each other down because they want to be on top. Mm -hmm. We're all so so different, different Mm -hmm. themes, that they were really willing to give us their secrets that they had learned years and years ago and stuff that they had spent maybe five or 10 years learning, they're, they're telling us. And that was such a, a great way to help build that. Now, through Skywalking to Neverland, we can help build other, other fans by helping them uh, promote their Kickstarter campaigns for their, for their short films, mm-hmm. for their fan films, 
and tell tell people who, who's out there doing fandom related things. And we've had a couple of people on who have written songs and have done videos, and we've 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 done interviews with them, and their views have gone up because now people other people know who they are. Yeah, kind of like a, a pay it forward a little bit, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. When Dan and I first started, you, your similar story is similar to ours. We, when we first started our podcast, we reached out to a lot of uh, f- f- other podcasters and folks that uh, kind of helped us along the way. And like you said, they just opened their doors to us, and we're we're just we're kind of blown away about the fact that you know they would just be, let's say take their time just to foster us and and kind of you know show us the ropes a little bit, and it helped us greatly. Yeah, yeah we so. we were. You know, I, 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 I want to give a couple of shout outs here sure. to those who helped us out, like Jeff and Colleen Roney from the Once Upon a Time Fan Podcast. Oh, yes. They were huge in, in helping us out. And Scott Murray from Assembly of Geeks. Mm-hmm. Shout right. out to those guys. Absolutely. And uh, actually, uh, our podcast have worked together rather well together behind the scenes quite a bit as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. With different contacts and uh, different suggestions, and uh, thanks to Sarah that we got our T-shirts up and rolling finally. So oh, yeah. we yep. appreciate that. Thank you again. Oh, nice. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so crazy that they don't offer orange. I know. It's sad. Yeah, we ran into that with Talking Apes TV because yeah, orange would be a great color. Yeah, they do it in the children's sizes. Oh, good. <laughs> but that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, we, we really wanted a Dr. Zayas orange for Talking Apes TV, which they don't have. So we got to reach out to them and tell them to run down to Teaser R Us and grab a big stack of oranges. <laughs> I'll just get a, a large kids, and I'm pretty hairy, so I'll look like Dr. Zayas. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So uh, it's, it, again, hearing you speak, it's, it's nice. It's, these are the perfect people to have on for this because – you know about family. You're a family yourselves. You have a Star Wars family um, through Twitter, through Facebook, through different podcasts. I mean, as far as I can remember, you were the ones who started the hashtag Podcasters Unite. And it was fun just watching your experiences at Star Wars Weekends last year and, and those pictures on Main Street of you with all the other great podcasters. So for you, what does Star Wars teach us about family? And how have you incorporated that into both your immediate family as well as your Star Wars family outreach with Skywalking through Neverland. I think first and, and foremost, like we've been we've been saying, it's just helping each other, mm. and we really do all help each other, and and that's what Star Wars is all about: helping those in need. You know, Luke, he didn't really have much in the way of the rebellion against the Empire, the Empire against the rebellion. He didn't he didn't really have a horse in that race, but he saw what what the empire was doing, destroying planets and bringing tyranny to the galaxy. So he put himself out there. He, he sacrificed himself for the betterment of, of the galaxy. Sarah, anything? Uh, no, yeah, I just, I just think it's important uh, with, with your star Wars family to just keep promoting that positivity around. Like, you know, you see someone promoting their fan film or their, their podcast, you know, try to retweet or share or uh, just comment, you know, um, just a little, a little goes a long way. And uh, I think that's how we try to keep incorporating um, family, our Star Wars family into our lives. You know, we just try to, yeah, just try to see where everyone, you know, just help each other. I like what you said, Richard. You guys are thinking about the burgers, aren't you? No, no, no. I, that was a hard question. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about burgers. I am too. <laughs> Me what, too. What yeah. do you guys think? What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, you know, it's it's it definitely about helping each other, and I think in the in the, all some of the things, you know, the Star Wars community is a family community. I think uh, we're all looking to promote each other's work and, and ideals, and, and support each other's uh, messages to, to get it. Like I said, we podcast. That's our that's our outlet. You know, some folks do all kinds of other stuff. Um, you know, and certainly too, I think it's handing off to that next generation as well. I mean, I've got a kids, Dan's got kids, and, and, and there's a lot of up, up and coming kids that are joining the, the, uh, fandom as, as it is today. And I think it's just incorporating good conversation, um, and, and just being able to, uh, foster a community that's going to, to last, uh, for the ages. I think you guys, you guys said it, put it perfectly. It's, it's just helping one another as far as, um, you know, being positive and what and what you do, and not being afraid of what you want to do either. Uh, you know, right. so if, like you guys said, I loved your idea about you know the road to 
to Anaheim and Celebration Anaheim and getting those folks that that need help or who've been through it a, min, a million times that uh, can can do that and portray that in a way for for other fans who are just getting started in their fandom uh, in a positive and a supportive way. Well, especially too, the positivity is the thing, and this is sort of the the white elephant in the room or pink elephant in the room or whatever color the elephant is. <laughs> we know that there is some negativity out there. And sure. we're not a podcast that likes to perpetuate that because that's just not who Corey and I are. And that's certainly not who, who the two of you are, which is one of the things that we love so much about you both. And it's very easy to tear people down, especially when you've never met them face to face and to throw rocks. But it's, it's even more rewarding and successful to reach out, to retweet, to comment, to promote one another. We are all, all in this together. And as you said, Richard, we have the same passions, but we have different avenues and ways of exploring that, different vessels. We all are basically on the same waters of fandom, and we have different ships. And let's take that and work together, because we all want to talk about Star Wars and promote this passion that we have. Because in our day-to-day lives, I don't often see people who care about Star Wars the way that I do, or that Corey does, or that the two of you do. So this is how we can build each other up, because this is a, a pretty exciting time to be a Star Wars fan, and just to embrace the diversity of one another. Yeah. Oh, here, here. Yeah. And I, I think positivity attracts positivity. That's right. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we 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 love to do the whole positivity, the, the positive spin on everything that we do. I mean, it's so easy to say, "Oh, we we don't like this, and we're going to mock it, and we're just going to tear it down just for the sake of tearing it down because we have a platform to do that." Mm-hmm. There, which, uh, unfortunately, some podcasts do do these days and and i've deleted so many because they're they've all gone on to this whole mocking negativity which i i just why 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 go that way right when you can be happy about something and this should be an escape it should be something that you go to as an island from negativity not the source of it yeah and there's there's ways of saying that you don't like something without tearing into it tact yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a, you know, you, there's an old expression, hate the sin, love the sinner. You may not like how someone's opinion of something, but there's still people with feelings and you're not always going to disagree. So it's okay to disagree, but it's not okay to be disagreeable. Mm, that's yeah. cute. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, very good. So as we've been talking about, uh, Star Wars and, and celebrations coming up, obviously it's about a month and some change away. We're all getting excited, packing our bags and things. Um, you're packing already. I am. I'm packing <laughs> my pants. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us about the the star, uh, star War Star Walking Through Neverland podcast stage and what you guys have planned, or um, maybe um, some of the things that you have have in store for for fans? Well, our show is going to be called Skywalking Through Neverland: An Interactive Fandom Adventure. Ooh. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, this and, is well. First of all, it's happening Friday. 3 to 4 p.m. on the podcast stage. Mm-hmm. And Richard, take it away. So we're not going to just relegate ourselves to podcasting. This is going to be formatted like a late night talk show. Nice. Mm. We're going to have guests. We're going to have games. We're going to have prizes. We're going to have raffles. We're gonna, it, it, everyone's going to be involved. If you've come just to sit there and watch, well, sit in the back because there's <laughs> going to be a lot of involvement here. Mm-hmm. A lot of involvement. And we've gotten Funko to sponsor prizes. We get a big box of Funko sitting right here. <laughs> Rancho Obi-Wan is going to be our grand prize. And the winner will win a 2015 membership wow. if they come in their Skywalking Through Neverland shirt. Yes. I saw that. That's very cool. Are you just doing like sort of a raffle or how, how can people win? We are going to have a raffle. We're going to raffles. And, um, and then, yes, I think, well, we haven't quite worked out the details yet, but I think the raffle tickets will be put in to play games to win. So as, when people come in, they, they will get a raffle. And sometimes that raffle will be will determine if, if you're going to be the one to play a game or to win a prize. Oh, that sounds so fun. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And our composer, Rob Dellinger, the John Williams of podcasting, <laughs> he's going to be there. He's going to compose a, uh, a live Skywalker of the Week jingle for one lucky winner. Wow. That's are so you, cool. Are we eligible? Or are we yeah, what do we, what do we, how do we do this? We have to do like handstands? What do we do? Yeah, show up at, show at up. 3 o'clock, yeah. get, your, get your raffle ticket, and you are automatically entered. We will awesome. definitely be there. Yeah, so we pretty much have three hours of fun 
condensed into 60 minutes. Yeah, we'll see how that <laughs> is going to work out. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds amazing. Now, and since it is interactive, will we need ponchos? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this is not Nickelodeon. This, okay. this, is not, this is not a Gallagher concert. Okay. <laughs> or, like, or like SeaWorld. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, the splash zone. You know, well, there's there's two sides of the splash zone and the fire zone. Oh. Okay, that that makes me think the game zone. That's a good idea. We should have people who want to play games sit in the game zone. There you go. <gasps> uh, okay. see, see, see. We're, we're, here, we're here to help. <laughs> yeah, we're here to help. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to be a, a great time, and we got a what like a 75 people already signed up. Uh, eight, I think 84. 84 when I people signed up. Well, we'll wow. see who comes because you never know what panels are going to be. Against us, but you know, right? You never know. Yeah, but, so yeah. it's it's going to be a, a great time, and I I just can't wait for this because Sarah and I are, are game coordinators for company picnics by trade. Yeah. Mm. So this is our arena. Oh, how wonderful! <laughs> I, we're we're excited. It's it's going to be pretty awesome. And speaking of awesome, we get to ask you. You had us on, uh, and we were able to. You know what? Yeah, I'm going to cut in here for one second. I'm so sorry. Joey Pittman, one of our, our great Skywalkers, he's also donated some prizes for us. Have a shout out for Joey Pittman, who donated some comic books and some toys and some really fun stuff. And he donated some stuff for our last listener party. And, and Joey, thank you very much for all your donations. Yeah, and there's still some prizes that we're working on with some more Skywalkers. Yeah, oh, yeah. There's some pretty big stuff come. Well, we're, we're, we're still working out the details. Yes. So, you know, just just come with a gift basket. <laughs> Sounds reasonable. Yes, you bet. I think it's going to be so much fun. Your, your uh, again, your passion is contagious, and your enthusiasm is is awesome. So we are very excited to to be to go there Friday from three o'clock to four o'clock in room two hundred eight AB. Correct. Yes. Uh, that is correct. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. Well, that's where we will be on Thursday. We hope you'll join us there from eleven thirty to twelve thirty. Podcasters unite. What can you say? And and you guys get to be first up. That's awesome. That's right. Uh, yeah, keep in mind too that uh, JJ Abrams and Kathleen Kennedy are on, and then oh, about an hour later, it's us. So that might be kind of hectic, but fun. Yeah, well, I, yeah, we're looking forward to your podcast stage as well. Well, thank you. There's going to be trained monkeys. So we're excited. Yes, train monkeys, and yes, really. No, <laughs> but enough, but enough, <laughs> I think I think oh, train oh, monkeys are oh. us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, so yes, we were on show number 65 with you both, and it was so much fun. And you had some really great questions for us. So we have some questions for you. It is, of course, our five questions that we ask each guest on Cough with Kenobi. And we'll go with ladies first. Sarah, what is your favorite Star Wars movie? Traditionally, it has always been Empire Strikes Back because it has the love story. (laughs) And I'm a total shipper. (laughs) Can can argue with that. What about you, Richard? I don't have a favorite Star Wars movie. I have a go-to Star Wars movie. Mm, okay. My my go-to Star Wars movie is Attack of the Clones. Really? Wow. I cool. love Attack of the Clones. I I love Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker. I think he's fantastic. And I don't see what people like people have problems with him. I just don't see that. I, I love the the story behind it. I love the the whodunit aspect of the plot. I love the Django Obi-Wan fight and the fact that this is the where we first get to see the beginning of the Clone Wars. And don't forget the Sound of Music scene. And the Sound of Music scene. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. With Anakin and Padme rolling around. Rolling around. The, yes. <laughs> yeah. And just the, the whole, the way that the Clone Wars is shot and structured, I, I just love that scene. I can watch that again and again and again and always see something new. It just, it just takes you out of what Star Wars always had been to that point and gives you a whole new spin on these battle scenes. You don't hear a lot of advocacy for Attack of the Clones, so I'm I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I, I love too. Attack of the Clones as well. Yeah, and and I've been, we've been listening to your show since the beginning, and oh, everyone always you. says the Empire Strikes Back, and mm-hmm. I yeah. I just want to give some some pure shout out to Attack of the Clones, and I can't wait to see it at Celebration Anaheim in 3D. That's oh, right. You know, That's you right. know what? I I'm going to skip our own panel. To go, <laughs> to go and see Attack of the Clones in 3D. Hey. So I may not be at our panel, Sarah. No, it's going to be at night. So let me retract that. I will be at our Scott Morgan <laughs> Interactive Fandom Adventure Show. That's good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> nice plug. Very good. <laughs> so moving to our second question, what is your favorite character, or who is your favorite character, Richard? You know what? I'm going to say Luke Skywalker just because he's always been my favorite character. So one I could always relate to. 
because I can never relate to the Han Solo type. I was always the kid just trying to figure out his, his way in the galaxy. And his struggles became my struggles. And growing up, when you're in those teenage years, you, when you don't know what to do, I would always say, what would Luke do? <laughs> and that would really help me through a situation because you wouldn't, I wouldn't really have to be myself. I would, at that point, take over the persona of Luke Skywalker. And no matter what I was facing, I could get through it because I wasn't me. I was Luke. I was pretty much taking on Luke Skywalker. And boy, did that really help me out during high school. Plus, you looked like him. And I looked like you get the, the blonde hair, the blue eyes. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. <laughs> our, our hunkiest guest so far. <laughs> well, I think so. Hashtag that. That's all that matters. That's right. <laughs> and Sarah, how about you? I think I have to say Han Solo because I always I was a big had a big crush on Han Solo, and so his, you would have ignored me in high school too. Well, I don't know. Did you look like Han Solo back then? No, more like Luke. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I would have been dissed. Would. No, I need, I need those scruffy nerf herders. Oh, that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Who's scruffy just, looking? <laughs> I know, exactly. Yeah, I'm not, I've never really been into the bad boy, except, I mean, Han Solo, I wouldn't consider him a bad boy, He's just because he, he has that heart of gold. Yeah, because he, he flies by his own rules. He does, True. he does. I, and it's kind of that alpha male thing. So I was always attracted to, you know, him and that, and that's why he's my favorite character uh, of Star Wars. Well, and he wears uh, a white shirt with a, it's just a little bit of black over it, so there's just that nice little blend there, too. Exactly. Symbolism, Corey. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your favorite line of dialogue or film moment? Okay, for me, I would have to say, and it goes, I'm a, I'm a big music person. I love, I mean, John Williams, of course, like we talked about. John Williams is, from Star Wars, is my favorite soundtrack ever, and so... My favorite movie moment has to do with the music, and that is Luke looking out at the binary sunset with that gorgeous French horn solo, and then the orchestra swells, and you just know that Luke is staring out, he's hoping, but he he doesn't really know what he's hoping for, and everything about A New Hope and Star Wars is encapsulated in that one moment in that music. Good answer, good answer. Very good answer. My favorite line is from Darth Vader in The Empire Strikes Back when Luke is trying to find him in the carpet freezing chamber and the lights go on and you just hear this dark, bellowing voice saying, the Force is with you, young Skywalker, but you are not a Jedi yet. Which is kind of like a push-pull, mixed signals thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, the Force is with you, but you're not really a Jedi, so it's very antagonistic. And just the way James Earl Jones delivers that line... Whenever we're watching The Empire Strikes Back, that's the part where I, I turn the volume up to 11. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know what? That's, this is the first time when someone's favorite uh, film moment is mine, too. <gasps> that's uh, cool. Wait, you turn wait, yours wait, up to 11? Out. You, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but just uh, with them, but, and even more so, like when they're standing there staring at each other and there's no music and no dialogue and they're just the silhouettes of them. I just think that's beautiful. Oh. Uh, mm-hmm. Very much is, but that's my favorite line. Even though I, I really love the Yoda line, "Do or do not, there is no try." Mm-hmm. Just that Darth Vader line. When I hear that, I, I just get goosebumps. But my favorite moment, I would say, comes once again in Attack of the Clones, when you have Anakin and Padme sitting at, at the dinner table at the Lars homestead, the same set they used for Star Wars, mm-hmm. and Kleeg Lars is telling Anakin about his mother and how the Tuscans came and and took her and Anakin just gets up and he knows he's got, he's got something to do. He gets up and just heads right out, which once again is one of those selfless moments that he he knows that there's danger out there, but he's going to go and get his mother back and that's it. And that's final. He just, he's just a family oriented uh, Jedi, which is kind of an oxymoron right there, Mm -hmm. but he had, he really had a love for his mother, and there was nothing that was going to stop him. And just Hayden's uh, performance in that scene, I think, is just phenomenal. Very well said. Very well said. So the next question is, if you collect, what is your favorite collectible that you own? For me, it would have to be the 97 Star Wars soundtracks, <laughs> the the special edition um, Star Wars and Return of the Jedi and Empire Strikes Back. The two-disc uh, sets? 
the two disc sets yeah. and those beautiful black um what are they books booklets really they're black booklets they are amazing so those are my original favorite collectibles but now i recently received as a gift a new collectible a han solo doll <laughs> the, what is it 13 inch or 15 inch from the disney store oh yeah yeah that that speaks you know and the blaster yeah he's amazing he sits in our kitchen and uh we kind of use him as a magic eight ball Whenever oh, we need a, a go-to answer, that. we just ask Han. <laughs> That's hilarious. He always talks Actually, first, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whatever, whatever he says goes. He says, <laughs> "Who's Scarfy looking?" Well, that's our. That's how we gonna we're gonna set our day. <laughs> I love it. Well, we we just don't know. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Hold on. Here's Sarah with with the Han Solo action figure. All right. I, I call him an action figure. She calls him a doll. A- ask a question. Uh who's Scruffy looking? On the tractor beam and pulling us in. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, well there you go. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just his way of saying. I don't think I set up Harrison Ford very well with my question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what he says next. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what we we hear that we hear no matter who's trying to hold you down, who's looking at you in a negative way, you just keep on going with your day. That's right. I like that. And say hey. Because <laughs> it'll be okay. Exactly. Oh, sorry, I couldn't resist. Richard, how about you? What's your favorite collectible you own? George Lucas DNA. <laughs> <laughs> What's this from? Some, some spittle or something like that. That the. Uh... Well, at, at, that's at, how that restraining order. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh yes, let's go with that. At Celebration Zero, <laughs> that was the Star Wars 10th anniversary convention. George was up on stage and he had a glass of water. And after after his Q and A panel was done, he put that down. And I raced to the stage and I took that. Did you really? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, I I also took Anthony Daniels' glass and Peter Mayhew's glass. Wow, wow that is cool. Hilarious. Yeah, so the the every, even though the Stouffer Hotel changed into I believe it's now the Hilton, I owe you three water glasses. <laughs> Wow. So, <laughs> but um, I'll go on from there because that's not really a cl- – well, is DNA – It's definitely a, cl- a one-of-a-kind. It is one-of-a-kind, exactly. He has one of Although a kind, I'm sure exactly. he's had water since then. Let's, <laughs> let's hope. <laughs> yeah, and since then, uh, you can only get so much stuff before you run out of space. Yes, mm-hmm. very and true. That's just what happened here. So we tend to go on the collectibles that are more user-friendly. Useful, yeah. Say stuff that you can use every day, like the the R two D two pepper grinder or the Darth Vader steering wheel cover. Mm-hmm. Oh or yeah, lightsaber umbrella or lightsaber lamp. Stormtrooper spatula. Stormtrooper spatula. <laughs> so stuff that you can use and not just put in a room and you hardly ever look at it, or box it up and put it in your garage. Do you have that R two D two car phone charger? Yes, yes, we do. Oh, is it cool? It's very cool because whenever you start your car, he beeps for about five minutes. Whoa, cool. <laughs> it's like, all right, R2, I get, I get the message and keeps on beeping. Yes, I know. No more burgers today. We got That's it. right. We're going to crash in the Dagobah. I get it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just surrounded by Star Wars stuff. I love it. Yeah, pretty much. We have the, the large figures surrounding our television. <laughs> we're, we're a sucker for the holiday ornaments and, and stuff you get at like Target or Walmart. And and. and- Plushes. And plushes. Like tauntauns. Oh, yeah. And plush, plush tauntauns, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, we get a wampa on our bed, a wookie on our bed. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll, I'll see this Han Solo doll on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Han, how'd you get up there? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, dude, to answer your question, yeah, we're pretty much surrounded by Star Wars and Disney. That's wonderful. So what particular messages or themes about the Star Wars saga resonate or speak to you? Um, for me, I think it's hope. Like, like I said, Luke looking into that binary sunset, you know, he's hoping his life will change. He's he's hoping. And, um, for me, that always struck me. So when I watch other movies like Tangled, for instance, and, you know, she's looking out the window at the, the floating lanterns and she's hoping like any, any time that happens in a movie, I just, I just tear up. And I think that has a lot to do with, um, the message that Star Wars has of hope. 
Now, in 1977, when, when I first saw Star Wars in its first run, yes, I was there. And there was a message that really stuck out to me, and I it's pretty much run my whole life up until this moment, and that is never land on Alderaan. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good. That's a good. That's a good message. Good one. <laughs> and here we are today. Yeah, right, here we it. are today. Oh, <laughs> uh, you're funny. So, so guys, where can people get in touch with you if they want to ask you a question or just say hello? Absolutely, you can find us. You can search "Skywalking Through Neverland," and uh, we are at skywalkingthroughneverland.com. And we're also wherever podcatchers can be found. So we're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. And we love it when people tweet at us. We are at Skywalking Pod. And I'm also at Jedi Tink. So uh, that's the Star Wars and Disney and me. And where else? Oh, yeah, Facebook, of course, too. Search Skywalking Through Neverland on Facebook. And you can also be reached at uh, Fangirls Going Rogue, too. Oh, yes, absolutely. I know we're, you invited us on as Skywalking Through Neverland. But, yes, I'm, recently, I'm a recent addition to Fangirls Going Rogue, which is on the Shot Glass Digital Network on um, the Rebel Force radio feed. And there you can find me as well. And Richard. Yeah, we also do another spinoff to Skywalking Through Neverland called Talking Apes TV. And that's where me and the Skywalking Through Neverland creative consultant, Mark Wagoshewitz, he and I talk about the TV series from 1974 to find out why it still stands up after 40 years. The Planet of the Apes TV series. The yeah. Planet of the Apes TV series. So we'll go, we'll go through each episode and go really in-depth to this show that is really fun because being made in 1974, you really see a lot of sign of the times and how that still stands up after four decades. Like apes and bell bottoms? Apes and bell bottoms. <laughs> Shag do and water bed, bean bags and just a microphone. Cyburns? Yeah, you, Cyburns, yeah. You definitely can't go wrong the, through Skywalking Through Neverland, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, they're a wonderful podcast. They're just... Great people. We thank you both so much and cannot wait to meet you at Celebration and, and also look forward to many more uh, podcasting experiences with you both in the future. Oh, Absolutely, likewise. Yes. likewise. Thank you for having us on. It's been our pleasure. And remember, never, never land, land on Alderaan. Our topic for show number 35 is Celebration Anaheim. How do you feel about this amazing convention? What are your plans for this exciting event? What are you most excited to see? Have you been to Celebration before? And if so, what advice do you have for the first-time attendees as well as the seasoned veteran? Are you planning on attending Disneyland? And how about the podcasting stage? Joining us on this topic is Amy Radcliffe from Full of Sith and StarWars.com to share her insights. In 300 words or less, be sure to send us an email or MP3 with your thoughts, comments, questions, and opinions to feedback at coffeewithkenobi.com. I like the sound of that. Echo 3 to Echo 7. Ah, nobody, do you read me? I saw part of the message. You... I seem to have found it. Our first email comes from Huey Cox, and he writes, Hi, Cup of Men. I remember Kathleen Kennedy saying that standalone films wouldn't focus on any of the core characters from the episode films. Do you think these plans have changed with rumors of a Han Solo Boba Fett film? I personally like to see original characters and stories in the standalone films. It would also be cool if they explored different time periods. Your show is really insightful. Keep up the good work. And then we started to interact a little bit, and he said he wanted to make sure they clarified he wants to see completely new characters in standalone films. The more entry points into the saga, the more lively the franchise will be. Love to see them either take place in the presence of hundreds of years in the past or the present. Anything that was a direct prequel to what we already know would be kind of disappointing. But I think comics and books are a great place to revisit old characters, especially now that it's all canon. So thank you very thank you very much, Huey, for that. Um, and as far as rumors of Han Solo Boba Fett films, what what are that? What's that, Corey? <laughs> well, he he said Cup of Ben. I, I'm assuming Ben Kenobi is our our former name, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, of course, but no, I mean, mm-hmm. like he's he's asking us to talk about rumors. Yeah, we don't we don't divulge a whole bunch of rumors here. We of course the swirls are on the internet. We talked about earlier uh, about rumors and just kind of we we detract from that a little bit. Um, I don't know of anything about this, so I, I can't speak to it too much. Um, 
you know, as a, as a fan and what I would like to see, uh, certainly any Star Wars film that centers on a, a, a central character would be fine with me. Uh, anything Star Wars is fine with me, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, whether they do, uh, you know, the char- the main three characters, Luke, Han, or Leia, or something. But, you know, he made a good point, too. Um, you know, they, we do divulge into this a little bit into the comics uh, land, uh, which is done famously uh, right now in Marvel Comics, or have the, you know, the three new lines here that are doing really well. Uh, you've got m- most of those, as far as I know, and and uh, so in that in that genre and that uh, capacity, they've done really well. So I couldn't see why a film couldn't do just as well. Well, I, and I love that what what Huey said here too. He said, "I think I pronounced his name three different ways." I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, my friend. I even spelled it phonetically too. Um, I I think that it would be cool. Um, I I don't think that the big three should be standalone focus, and I don't think that Huey does either. I do think it would be fun to make it a new character. There's all these. The speculation about who Sarah Michelle Geller is going to play mm-hmm. on uh, on Rebels, and I, I think it would. And I saw Mark Newbold tweet this out too, uh, or on Facebook. I prefer to be somebody original. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of my issues with uh, the first Darth Vader comic is at the end there's some familiar characters that show up, and I'm thinking, well, come on, let's let's get some originality here. I think that these characters that are established are wonderful, and we love them. We have action figures and statues and T-shirts full of them. But because this is such a huge, amazing tapestry, I like to see original stuff too. So, I mean, in a perfect world for me, the standalone films would be connected to each other, but they also could kind of be their own little thing, like like what Marvel does. That's always yeah. a template to me. Well, the other thing too is, um, you know, it's hard to recast those kind of things, those classic characters uh, oh, yeah. in the right light and get it just right. I think that's more like, it's like, uh, you know, they break the mold after that type of stuff and... And it's it's very difficult and it's very um very hard on I think fandom as far as folks wanting you know that that young character back uh, whether it be like I said a Han Solo or whatever but you know another another uh, another thought here is you know so much things that did well for the the EU series and all the video games and stuff were original characters people really uh you know got in line with that and and really enjoyed uh, meeting new characters and following their adventures so. I don't see why that wouldn't work in film as, as well. So it's it's I don't know I'm I'm kind of a mind of a mind of both areas. Uh, again, I don't really care as long as it's Star Wars. <laughs> Our next email comes from Max Filner, and they write, "Hey, lighten up! Nobody gets killed until the next episode." Spoiler alert: The report is no casualties. You guys are dark. Remember, this is Disney. You really think they're they are killing these guys right and left? It's Ezra and Kanan for goodness sake. Keep up the good work. Enjoy listening. And that's Mags uh, Filner. Uh, Mags, you know, it's an interesting discussion about uh, if they are killing stormtroopers on on Rebels uh, or not. Now, um, one instance that I know of for sure that uh, Pablo Hidalgo uh, talked about was the the scene um, where Chopper shoots some of the uh, air, uh, stormtroopers out into the airlock and they go out in space. Uh, yeah. And the the com- commentary there was was their armor, um, you know, sealed tight or airtight so they could survive. Uh, and he said, no, it wasn't. So obviously in space you cannot breathe, and no one can hear you scream. Uh, so it's a matter of, uh, you know, it, it's life and death. It's a rebellion. It's a war. Uh, it's what's going Didn't on. Did he say that the the armor is is um, airtight, but they have a small air supply? They have a small air supply, but I think that uh, they have to have that breathing apparatus on there. Yeah. So. I mean, in the other instance, too, you know, it, it, the folks that are getting shot by laser blasts and, heck, the fir- the premiere episode, um, I, oh, boy, what's... Um, Spark of Rebellion. Spark, yeah, Spark of Rebellion uh, had, um, you know, what was one of the last scenes had um, Kanan picking up Ezra uh, from the ghost ship. So Agent Kallus is hanging on by a thread there by the, the ledge, and he, he the Stormtrooper makes a joke or something, he kicks him off. Now, where oh, does yeah, this guy land? Where does this that. guy land? Uh, he he obviously falls into the depths of the, the ground floor of whatever, but the ground floor. I don't know how that Literally. works. But you know, it, you know, you also you think about Disney. Disney kills a lot of folks. Yes. Uh, when that, when that, I read this, yeah. Mags and I emailed back and forth a little bit, and it was okay. very fun. Mags is, is very cool, very smart, and yes, um, and I'm glad you brought that example up, Corey. Agent Cal's kills a stormtrooper in cold blood because he's frustrated. Mm-hmm. We're not the one who's dark. We're just calling it as we see it. 
Disney, um, it's rare for a Disney film for there to be both parents. Um, in many of the films, whether it's Bambi's mother, Simba's dad, uh, for goodness, uh, Anna and Elsa's parents, they, people die. I mean, Disney has a lot of elements of dark to it, and it also has elements of light. And you're talking about, as you said, a rebellion. So there's going to be a war, there's going to be conflict, there's, there's going to be a loss of life, and it's, uh, it's got to be a challenge for the animators, I'm sure, but and for Dave and everyone. But it sure has been a wonderful show, and I cannot wait for season two. And and to be interesting to see where the level of violence progresses because the the stakes have been raised. So it'll be be fascinating to see what happens. Our next email comes from Chad LaForce, and uh, he says, "Hey guys, you might enjoy the colored technical art I've I've made for the new." Kylo Force Awakens Tri-Saber Cross Guard Saber over at trisaber.com. Just sharing uh, best that's uh, Chad, Chad LaForce. Uh, Chad, I checked that out. It's pretty cool. Uh, he's got like kind of this like what you call it, like a peel away type design. It obviously looks like uh, he's done an animation work uh, here on this. It's kind of cool uh, as far as you know the way the saber might possibly work. Uh, he's obviously referring, referencing back to the Force Awakens teaser trailer we saw back in December uh, of the Tri Saber, um, the unknown figure in the forest was holding. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how this is going to play out uh, in in the film and how they're going to re- be represented. But um, you know, he's got it broken down here to kind of some of the different uh, types of different designs as far as components and what goes in it possibly just as you know, the other thing too here is uh he, chad's got such a great imaginary force here force did i say that <laughs> he did <laughs> and uh but he broke he breaks it down pretty down right down to the crystal of the saber uh, so i would encourage folks to who are interested in something like this to go check it out and you kind of got some some background uh look kind of like it's pulled right from the some kind of archive of some co- sort but uh check it out see what you think and uh let chad know our next email comes from Dennis Keithley, who is a recent guest of Rebels Reactions, and he writes, If it isn't too late to participate, here is my thought on Star Wars and relationships. The prequel trilogy is a fine example of why most relationships cannot be hidden. In Attack of the Clones, Padme admonishes Anakin that they cannot afford to be in love because they couldn't accept the consequences. For her, it would interfere with her role as a galactic senator, and it would mean Anakin's expulsion from the Jedi Order. When he responds that they could keep it a secret, she responds that they couldn't live like that. They would be living a lie. When asked if he could live that way, Anakin prophetically states, no, it would destroy us. This is exactly what happened. With their relationship a secret, Anakin had nobody he could confide in to find the help he needed to save Padme from her visions, except Palpatine. Palpatine was able to prey on Anakin's fears to lead him down a dark path. In the end, Anakin succumbed to the dark side and Padme died in their marriage along with her. This is a drastic example, but the bottom line is that successful relationships need support in order to flourish. On an unrelated and personal note, my wife and I got engaged the night the special edition of A New Hope was released to theaters. I can't watch that movie without thinking back to that special evening, and I am fortunate to have a spouse that shares an interest in science fiction, fantasy, and adventure. Again, that's from Dennis, and thank you, Dennis, for sharing that with us. That's awesome. What a cool memory, and... Star Wars already meant so much to you, and now it's just on a whole other level of amazing. So that's great. And I love your insights onto Padme and Anakin. You're you're absolutely right. You know, relationships, you need to support one another to flourish. And I couldn't say it any better myself. And thank you for calling back to our show, Our Wives. I think that may have been the most fun show for me personally that I've ever recorded and insanely biased and rightfully so. Our next email comes from Jennifer Regis. Uh, she says, Hello, I wanted to write you guys because I just discovered you last week as I was looking for some Star Wars podcast to really help me understand the Star Wars universe. You see, I'm a new Star Wars fan, really new, and the whole world can seem a bit in- intimidating to me. But one of the things I love about it is that the philosophy and how deep it can be. I especially love listening to your anal- analysis of many different topics in the Star Wars universe. Now onto my question. I love the Star Wars Clone Wars series by Gendy Tartakovsky, and I was wondering, do you think that the series will ever be embraced back into the Star Wars brand with open arms? It is such a beautiful animated series, and while the episodes were short, I love how it is able to evoke lots of emotion without the characters saying very much. Almost like Tartakovsky's other series, Samurai Jack, 
If you haven't seen it, it's please check it out. You won't regret. Do you think it is possible that it could get a Star Wars Legends banner? I feel like it is such a waste to have people forget about such a great series and that makes me sad that Lucasfilm is treating it what, like an ugly stepchild, also known as Star Wars Christmas Special. Thoughts? As from Jennifer Regis. Jennifer, you know, um, I think that Tartoski series has a special place in a lot of fans' hearts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I wasn't really keen into it when it started off at first either. Um, I think Dan kind of really reeled me into the Clone Wars all uh, overall. So I, I did kind of start with that. I remember it popping up. Um, I want to say it popped up somewhere. Well, these were the ones that, you know, the, the, they was, came out there just two minutes right. long, and then they combine them all together on the DVD. And the DVD yeah. right now, currently, which is out of print, is the only way that you can see them. Do you have these? I think you... Let me borrow this. Did I? Do you ha- did you give it back? <laughs> you gave it back. Oh, because I, I know um, I have them. Right. Apparently, I had them until my house. Yeah, I, sorry about that. I'm going to send Boba Fett after you. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think... I mean, her, her, her passion here is, you know, obviously the style in this... In this her love for this series because, like I said before, I, I don't think it's a loss on anybody. I don't, I don't think um, any no, fans have forgotten this. Um, but definitely, I think this was kind of a kind of a shot in the dark for for Star Wars and Lucasfilm in the beginnings. Uh, I think they were just trying 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 it out and seeing how it's going to feel uh, as far as a, a you know a full blown cartoon series uh, at the at its early stages. So, it really, rightly so has a good point uh, in Star Wars fandom. I think as far as you know, making Clone Wars and even Rebels for what it is today. So, I mean, I don't think fans discount it. Maybe Lucasfilm does. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't think know they how discount to discount it. She, she mentioned, is it, I'd like to see it get the Legends banner. I think mm-hmm. it is. I think it does have a Legends banner. I, I does mean, it? the only reason it doesn't is because, you know, it's not out in the public domain mm-hmm. because the DVD is out of print, but you can get it on Amazon or in, or eBay, you know, fairly easily. And, I think it was overshadowed because the Clone Wars, the the Dave Filoni Clone Wars series, which is canon and was always canon pretty much, um, that overshadowed it, but not because um, for any reason other than it was newer. And obviously, George Lucas worked closely and intimately on that series, so that means a lot to me. But I love the Tartakovsky series. I think it's wonderful. I think the last couple episodes were grievous. Um, goes and kidnaps Palpatine are phenomenal. I would go so far as to say that that version of Grievous is the best version of Grievous that is out there, including Revenge of the Sith. That's a big, tall order there, pal. Yeah, but I mean, he's scary. He's intimidating. He's ruthless. He doesn't just um, twitch his mustache and run away. He <laughs> attacks, and he is lethal and scary. So I, I highly recommend that. Yeah, and Jennifer, you know, is, is your points thought out that you had just discovered us and kind of getting into the Star Wars fan community, uh, I would encourage you to just engage, you know, uh, get, get online and, and talk to folks like we talked earlier. Uh, you know, it's there's a lot of folks out there that are into this stuff. I would, you know, tweet about it, so people say. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there that have a lot of positive things to say about that series. And, you know, uh, more power to you, and thanks for listening. Yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for being a part of Coffee with Kenobi. I'm glad you found us. Our last email... It comes from Andrew from Grand Rapids, and he writes, I know this is completely out of left field, but I was recently listening to old episodes of the podcast and got to the one about Darth Maul, and I had to email and contribute to the discussion. Sorry for the unrelated email. Well, Andrew, please don't apologize. We are so happy to have you. And he writes further, Anyway, Darth Maul is my favorite Star Wars character, and I enjoy the episode, but I think you guys miss a huge aspect of Maul as a character. My favorite aspect, at least. I love Maul because he's ultimately a tragic character. He was taken from Dathomir as a child and raised to be a killing machine. The most sour expression of this comes in a lawless on the Clone Wars. Sidious kills Maul's brother and then puts Maul down easily. At that point, we see the return of that, scar- of that scared child who is being raised to become the ultimate Sith weapon. He is much more than just an obstacle for the heroes to get through or a cool-looking character that is cool martial arts with a lightsaber. To me, he is one of the most tragic characters in all of Star Wars on top of being a cool Sith assassin is fueled by rage instilled in him from childhood. Thanks for entertaining my late night ramblings about Maul, but I am very passionate about the character. Love the show, guys. Keep up the great work. Well, Andrew, thank you so much. 
that is, in fact, a very important aspect of them all that we didn't really capitalize on when we were talking with Jordan Mason when he was on. Uh, I agree. I think for me, Darth Maul is a bit clouded because the comic book series that Dark Horse put out, um, which I haven't really heard a heck of a lot about. I know I was not thrilled with it personally. Um, but he is tragic when you consider that he basically didn't have a choice and who he became. I mean, later you could argue that as an adult, he had, you always have a choice, but he was almost brainwashed to become a member of the Sith and, and that's mm-hmm. horrible. So, I mean, and you're talking about some of the most powerful episodes in all of animation anyway with the lawless as it is. But yeah, I, I should have thought of that before. I'm glad you brought it up. And that is my friend, why you are here with us. Thanks again for being a listener. Not only that, Dan, but uh, I want to say, too, you know, Maul, I think, was just a pawn, too. I mean, everybody's got their story, and obviously he was, uh, you know, used to further the Emperor's moves. Um, you know, he, he's using everybody as a chess piece in this big game. Even Anakin, you know, I think is a, a oh, giant, giant chess, chess piece. So it's it's not so much, I mean, uh, um, it, it's a tragic in that, in that sense, I guess. He, he hit it just dead on there. Um, but I think too, it's, it's still, he's a moving piece. Uh, and so, you know, the way, um, he's put out in, in episode one and even in like some of the series and stuff, it's, it's, he's there, but I think he's, he, like you said, he's kind of got a larger story to tell and we just haven't seen all that yet. And, and Dan, like you mentioned too, the, the comic series doesn't flush that out entirely. Um, certainly there's more, more to talk about and more to, to put together, but I certainly liked your, your thoughts here, Andrew. Thanks so much. If you would like to respond to our question of the show, have a comment, or just want to say hello, send us an email or MP3 at feedback at coffeewithkenobi.com. Or if you have a specific question or comment for either of us individually, email us at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com or Corey C at coffeewithkenobi.com. Or visit us at coffeewithkenobi.com and click on the Contact Us section or comment on one of the stories featured on the site. If you enjoy the show, please write a review in iTunes or Stitcher. You can also like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash coffeewithkenobi, as well as keep up to date at our Twitter feed at coffeewithkenobi. You can also find us on Tumblr at coffeewithkenobi.tumblr.com. If you enjoy the jazz music, the album is Eye to Eye by Steve Torok. Give the evacuation code signal. That's it for show number 34 of Coffee with Kenobi. A huge thank you to Richard and Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland for joining us and sharing their thoughts on building community in Star Wars fandom. Be sure to check out their awesome podcast on iTunes and follow them on Twitter at SkywalkingPod. Thanks also to Rob from the Bearded Trio, media specialist Lisa Dullard, our Coffee with Kenobi bloggers, and to everyone who contributed to this show and to all of you out there who listen and email Coffee with Kenobi. Don't forget to send us your comments and opinions the topic for show number 35, Celebration Anaheim. This is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. There's no one here.